Good evening. We'll be starting the program in just a moment. Good evening, I'm Callie Crossley. Welcome to A Year Apart, A Pandemic in Photographs. We're gonna get started with a rich conversation, but I just have a few housekeeping notes. Now, by now, you've probably done a lot of these virtual events, but just in case it's your first time, um, your microphones are muted, your video is turned off, and we cannot take your comments in the chat box. There may be other relevant information we put there, so you can check that out. But for your questions, go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and put them there, and we'll have time for questions at the end of this conversation. Um, also, uh, there is a closed captioning available for all w WGBH events. If you want to turn that off, go to the bottom of your screen and click on that as well. This talk is being recorded by WGBH's forum network and will be published on their website. And we'll share that link and others with you tonight in the chat. So we're going to get started and I'm going to give you a very brief introduction for our guests tonight. Who I'm so excited to, for you to hear from. Um, you can find their full, rich bios, again, in the chat and on the website. Jessica Rinaldi is a Boston Globe photographer who won the Pulitzer Prize for feature photography in 2016. Angela Rowlings is a Boston-based independent writer and photojournalist who spent 16 years as a Boston Herald staff photographer. Meredith Neerman is Director of Photography at GBH. With over two decades of experience as a photographer, she oversees photography and photojournalism for GBH and GBH News. And Brian Snyder is a Boston-based senior staff photographer with Reuters, who has been twice named Photographer of the Year by the Boston Press Photographer Association. Now, for our conversation tonight, we've grouped together so many of their wonderful photos that they've taken over the last year under themes. And our first theme is really the start of the pandemic, facing the threat. And Brian, your photo is up first, one of them. Here's the thing, a year ago, you were flown to Seattle, second week of March to cover the pandemic. And this photo was taken outside the Life Care Center of Kirkland. People will remember that was a very, became a very important spot as we started to learn about COVID. Tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, March 5th, I was in on a street in Cambridge when Elizabeth Warren withdrew from the ra presidential race. And the week later I was in Seattle to you know, get closer to the COVID story. Um, the yeah, the funeral, the nursing home was was I think when everyone in this country realized the danger dangerousness of COVID, like the 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 way the families couldn't visit their loved ones inside, the number of people who died there, like this really set the stage for everything that came after. Did you understand in that moment exactly what was going on? No, not at all. I don't think any of it. Well, I mean, no, personally, no. I mean, I understood in that, you know, in Seattle, this is what it looked like. But I don't think there was any way to see that that was going to become what everywhere looked like. And as you're taking these photos, um, is is it occurring to you this may be bigger than 
everybody thinks it is, or is this is just another day that you know of a kind of a terrible situation? I mean, now looking back, yes, absolutely. At the time in March a year ago, I don't think I don't th I I didn't realize you know where this was going that it would last a year, that it would take so many lives, that it would change so many lives. I don't think I, I didn't realize it. Let's switch to your, your photos, Jessica, and uh, take a peek at uh, some of what you were doing at the time. Um, we're right, these are photos now that I think we think we've become familiar seeing, the ambulance photos. Um, tell us about what was happening on the ground as you were taking these photos. Yeah, I think just to, to put us back in that moment, this was, you know, in the beginning of April, right? So the whole state was locked down. The city of Boston was locked down. People weren't going outside. If we were going to the grocery store at all, we were going for, you know, to shop for two weeks at a time. People were really scared. So uh, we got the opportunity to do a ride along with the CMS crew and, um, and they do 24 hour shifts. And so we spent 24 hours with them, Mark Arsenal, the Globe reporter and I did. And, um, you know, we just felt like if these guys are going out and they're doing this work and they're getting really close, um, you know, we sort of owe it to them to, to honor their story and share it with people. But it was a really scary thing to do. So at that point, you had a sense of the weight of it. Yes, I think um, I think at that point, you know, people were getting really sick and they were starting to die and we understood you know, it's interesting because the CDC had still kind of was flip-flopping on the mask, um, you know, sort of uh, guidance. So I remember I had an N95, like we had them, we put them on when we got into the ambulance, but then we would take them off, <laughs> which seems like crazy to me now. Um, so I think we, we understood, but we didn't we didn't fully grasp exactly how it worked at the time. Like we, we knew that we were very close to COVID obviously. And, you know, as a result of doing this story, um, because we got so close to it, we decided, both Mark and I decided afterwards that we would quarantine um, just out of an abundance of caution. And luckily neither of us got sick, but, you know, we were, we were very close to people with COVID doing this story. You were truly facing the threat. Yeah, in that yes. moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Angela, let's take a look at some of your photos on this theme of uh, starting the pandemic and facing the threat. And I wonder um, if maybe you can answer the question that I'm sure all of you felt because now um, uh, Jessica was just saying she was feeling that the weight as did Brian. Um, did you start to feel that as you're taking these photos? These are amazing photos, all of them. Yeah, this one was still early on in March. It was one of the first testing sites that I had access to. And I think it was when we were just really starting to realize that it was a major problem. I don't think we realized how long that it would last. I think we thought maybe it would last a couple months. Um, but at that time, we started being more and more careful in covering different situations. Um, the first couple months, I was just wearing sort of a fashionable scarf to cover my face. Um, we didn't really have proper um, proper masks um, to use at the time. I had one N95 that I would only use if I went indoors somewhere. But that was around the time we were starting to avoid that. Did you feel personally under threat of your Vulnerable, personally vulnerable? Um, yeah, I did. Um, I personally have asthma and I get bronchitis just from a general cold. So it made me very nervous to go indoors and even covering press conferences where people were still only told, oh, just stay six feet away. And reporters and governmental staff people were taking off their masks once they were situated. And I don't think they were thinking like, photographers have to move around a space to take photos and we have to get up close. Like we don't have the luxury of working from home. We actually have to be out on the street. In fact, um, one of you said that you really felt like you were, uh, well, you are, uh, Meredith, I think it was you, essential workers really on the front lines like so many other um, essential workers because you can't really be far apart to do your work. 
right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's no, I mean, you know, you can t take a screenshot on Zoom, but that's really not what was needed here. There's, there's no getting around that uh, photographers have to go out in the field and get close to the things that we're documenting. Um, so in that sense, I, I think very much frontline essential workers. So and, Angela, and, we're go, no, go ahead, Jessica. <laughs> uh, we were considered uh, to be frontline workers. We were cleared in the beginning to go out and to be able to go out and document this stuff when everything was shut down. So um, Angela, we're looking at your photo of uh, a wake and burial for Anne Lyon. And I'll note that earlier on, uh, Jessica had a picture in a funeral home. So we're going to take a look at both of these sets of photos. So first, Angela, tell me about this wake and burial. So this wake, normally there would have been a full funeral and um, mass and big burial. Instead, it was limited um, to a brother and sister and their immediate family members. Um, they commented to me that there would have been minimum 50 people present. They would have been joking and telling stories and then maybe going to a pub afterwards to you know kind of share their their pain and also their love for um for Ann Leiden and they were not able to do that and that kind of I mean you see the empty chairs you see the space um in there that normally there'd be people hugging and holding each other um so that really that really hit me that people can't grieve people really need touch and company when they're grieving. And this has really taken that away from people. Hmm. Um, let's go back now to Jessica, to your uh, photos in the funeral home, because um, Angela's photo uh, evokes a lot of this, but we're now, at, even at the start of this, we're talking about death and dying. It becomes more prominent. And the way we find out about it really is through your photos, because none of us, we're all at home under a state of emergency. So we don't see this. And only the people, as Angela has said, who are very close to those who are dying. And even then they can't get close. So Jessica, there was a particular um, conversation about this photo of yours. Um, with the woman in the casket and the feet. It has, it strikes you, of course, because it's startling. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that you can't escape in a pandemic that death is a very big theme and it's something that you have to figure out a way to illustrate. And I tried to do it as delicately as I possibly could, but you know, I also wanted people to connect with this and I wanted them to understand that this is real, that you know, this was an, a funeral home in East Boston. Um, they were overrun. In a normal month, they would have done maybe 25 funerals. In this past April, they did 71. They had nowhere to put the bodies. They were bringing them into what would have normally been a tribute lounge uh, where people would have gone to take a break from, you know, the wake or something to have coffee. And it was just overfilling. Um, with bodies because they had nowhere else to put them. And I, I was at this time, you know, I think there were so many people out there that really didn't believe that the pandemic was real, right? And I was sort of getting emails from people like that being like, why, why do you guys keep um, telling these lies about, you know, hospitals being full and people dying? And I thought, okay, like we kind of need to put a photo like this out there so that people can understand that this really is real and it's affecting so many people who couldn't be with their loved ones, like Angela was saying, you know, um, I spent like three days in this funeral home and it was, it, it was heartbreaking to hear everybody's stories. Did you get a different response when these photos, you know, when people could see these photos? Same, Angela, you can jump in on this as well. I mean, when people can actually see this for themselves, we're looking at the photograph, are, was there a different kind of resonance for some, perhaps? I think for some, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of people reached out um, to say that it really hit, it really hit home for them, and they kind of could understand it in a bigger, broader way. Some people were rightfully, perhaps, upset by you know the the kind of shocking nature of an image like this. Um, but I still think it's really important 
I, you know, nobody wants to be the person hanging out in a funeral home taking photos, right? Like, you don't want to be the person that shows up unannounced to a funeral. But I have to say that every family I approached in the course of this story, they all said yes. Um, and I was really blown away by that. And I think that, that a lot of it was that they all wanted people to understand how dangerous this was and, you know, how much it really meant for their families not to be able to say goodbye to their loved ones, to be there in that final moment. Mm -hmm. They didn't want it to happen to other people. So let's move on to our next theme, which uh, we're titling emptiness. Um, again, we've just discussed that most of us, those of us I'm talking and those of us who are in this room looking at these photographs, were nowhere near any of these scenes because we were under quarantine. So Meredith, this is your picture. What were you trying to express in this moment? Um, it seems kind of shocking that this is Boston and and that's it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and and Kelly, I'm sure you know this view well too because this is the Turnpike, looking east towards downtown Boston from Brighton. And you know, on any given day, uh, whether it's rush hour in the morning or evening or even midday, this just does not look like that during the work week. Um, and this is really what the streets look like, uh, you know, whether it was the turnpike or a busy road in a town or a city. And there was just something so striking about that emptiness and knowing that, um, you know, it, it just so quickly we went from a very alive, busy world with people flowing through with their lives to just every, just people being invisible. And I, I'm glad that we let in with the other images because I think the contrast between what you saw in the earlier images of hospital settings, what was going on in people's homes, hospitals, nursing facilities, funeral homes, you know, just so much unclear, even chaos, and then loss to be, you know, contrasting it with this, the, just the absence of people, yet knowing that there's so much happening, I think was, you know, it was very profound as a photographer. Um, this next image, if I, I can jump to it, this is actually, I took with my iPhone and I wasn't even planning on shooting, but I was I was walking to um, try to document what things were looking like uh, as uh, first couple of weeks of the lockdown. And I looked down on a street near my home and I saw this scene, which I've seen other times before. I mean, who hasn't seen kids, remnants of children's play left somewhere? And normally that, at least for me, evokes something very positive, you know, you can almost imagine children playing and rushing off or, um, and yet it took on such a different meaning here um, for me. And I was I was sort of very uh, struck by it as representative of the, the sort of absence of people that I felt as I made my way down the street and, and through my work. And is it harder to um, photograph the absence of something? You know, usually we're yeah. trying to capture something that's full um, I, I actually didn't find it hard, though, though it certainly could start to feel like, wow, another empty street, another empty street, another closed down business. But, you know, I, it made me realize how much when you look around, the world we've created is, is all in some way remnants of human life. I mean, whether it's a park or, I mean, Jess has a, a beautiful photo coming up that um, she can talk about, but, you know, uh, even an empty building or an empty street or, you know, a subway moving through and nobody getting on it, all of those things hint back to people and to living. And so in that sense, the, the emptiness becomes your subject as it's representing, you know, what, what normally would have been there, at least for me. Um, Jessica, I think when we see in your photograph the, the kids' playground, just as uh, Meredith was talking about seeing that ball and being reminded of children, I think the absence of those voices, I mean, you can almost, it's almost palpable when you see that in your photograph. I assume that's what you were going for. Yeah, definitely. And also that it, it felt so shocking to see a playground covered in caution tape, right? Like this notion that we weren't supposed to touch anything, that children weren't supposed to go out and play and, you know, do all the things that little kids do. Um, it just kind of speaks to the, the great fear that we all had in this moment. Um, Alfred Eisenstadt said, when I have a camera in my hand, I feel no fear. Is that how we all fear? Would you agree with that, photographers? Brian, you're shaking your head. That's a no, huh? No, absolutely not. <laughs> He's much more confident than I am, I guess. 
I mean, then this one, I mean, there was, there was an added layer here of, you know, our health, our personal safety, our, you know, we were at risk and that that's different than most other assignments short of covering a war or a, you know, really violent protest. Um, you know, there was an added layer of personal risk here. Mm. And what I think the thing about that risk, sorry, if I could just jump in, is that in, in every other thing that we do, I think photojournalists always have this kind of, people always label us like we run towards the fire, right? And I think most of us would admit that, that that's in our DNA. But this was invisible. This was a threat that we couldn't see. So, you know, you could get COVID covering a high school hockey game just as easily as you could being in a COVID ward. It just, you have no idea. And normally when we take those risks, we're just assessing our own risk. We're not thinking about bringing that risk home to our families um, and, the, and the, our subjects, the people that we come into contact with on a daily basis. And um, Brian, this was something you actually had to deal with because you did get COVID. Yes. I, um, I was in Georgia at the turn of the year for the runoff elections for the Senate and came home with COVID that, uh, so that was, you know, the second, first, second week of January and um, I'm still sick. So yeah, I definitely, uh, it caught up with me after uh, almost a year. So you know the subject inside out, literally. You know, from, um, as yes, you I can, um, if I ever, if I had any, uh, if I was ever worrying about empathizing with my subjects, I certainly can now. Well, you know, empathy is huge as um, something that uh, really comes through in our next theme, which is food insecurity. Um, it's really hard to to at any given day and and on any given day pre covid we know people were hungry in this country um Brian but this photo with these two people really is quite it gets you so this was um Sandra and Gabrielle her daughter Gabrielle they had actually been at a a protest because they are also facing eviction they're sort of many months behind on their rent at this point and um you know, they were brave enough to come out and allow their story to be told, um, which was certainly draining in of itself. And then afterwards, they went to the food bank to get some food and they were waiting for a ride to get this stuff home. And, you know, you can just see how tired and drained and exhausted they are with all this. She's Sanders well, lost her work. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one thing that the emptiness one thing the emptiness did is it made some other things more apparent. And I think the food insecurity is one of them. I mean, when you're driving around and there's no one on the street and you come around a corner and there's a line three blocks long, like it really stands out because there's nothing else on the street, nothing else out there. So, and that's what I wanted to get to because I, I think early on when the food secure insecurity story was was being shown to us by other photographers around the country. One of the ones that stands out in my mind, perhaps for all of you as well, is the one that was taken in Texas overhead. Uh, it was overhead and the, you could see like for miles and miles, the cars lined up and the people lined up trying to get boxes of food. And it struck me looking at your photo that there's two ways of doing this and all of you have done it. You can do the long lines, which is ugh, that gets you as well, but you could also come very close in these intimate scenes as you have here, again, with this young lady looking at this food, um, Brian, and that that has another way of, of sort of speaking to you emotionally. Um, and for you in this moment, why was the small, why did that feel like that was right, to t the right way to tell this story? Well, I think your panel's probably a little skewed. You have four photographers that would always, if given the choice whether to tell an intimate story or a more more other kind of a story, they're, all four of us are going to choose the more intimate version. So um, that was the, the previous picture was in Seattle. That was, you know, early on, like all these kids who normally would be going to school would normally get their meals at school. I mean, a large, you know, some large number of children, that's, two or three of their meals a day are from school. And so they were trying to replace those and school was closed. And so families were allowed to come to the school and be handed these plastic bags of, you know, basically cafeteria food, cold cafeteria food to take home. And she had come with her mother um, to pick up their lunch for the day. And they, there were free books there that they could pick up. 
I think we need to, uh, with your with your photos, Angela, to to demonstrate that you know this is not over. I, I know you didn't take this that photo now, but but this continues. I'm looking at I, your uh, yeah. Go ahead. Hmm? I think what's so jarring about this. I mean, as photographers, we've always covered poverty in in some story or another. Um, this has really brought it out into the public. Um, partially because people couldn't be indoors as much. And you would just see these incredible lines of people. These, this photo is in Chelsea. Um, these are neighbors. They had both gone to a pop-up um, food pantry where they just, the National Guard brought in boxes and boxes of food and um, usually some meat, some vegetables. Um, there were also some school lunches that they would provide. Um, Chelsea, from what I saw, did a good job of reaching a large number of residents who were suffering more than a lot of communities in terms of how many COVID cases there are, how many essential workers are there um, in tight living conditions. And, you know, so many people were ill. But the other thing that struck me is that this could be any of us. You know, it's not just, um, oh, these poor people who are kind of getting their food bank supplies quietly, this is very much out in the public. And you would see people, in addition to the most poor people that would be out there, you would see a lot of middle-class people or formerly middle-class people who had lost their jobs in the arts industries, in theater, in, um, in food service, in a lot of other service jobs that were cut off um, by the pandemic. And these are people that had made, were making good livings until this happened. And then suddenly they're just trying to get food for their kids. And plenty of evidence that people who used to donate to certain food banks were now in line to receive donations. I mean, I think that's, that's a piece that uh, really stays with you when you understand that. And I think may, to your point, have opened up people's eyes to realize that it could be anybody. Um, something that hit everybody, Education. Oh my God, we're still wrestling with that um, because it was so it's so complicated, and I don't think we're going to know for a while, Meredith, exactly the the full impact of of having kids out of school and in school and hybrid and the teachers and the whole nine yards. So let's start with uh, one of your photos that you chose here and tell us about it. Yeah, and I just want to add that um, you know I, I often think of the word upended. I think of that word a lot this last year, and and I, you know there are just thousands of stories just about the pandemic and education. It's just been so profound for so many. Um, but um, what you're looking at here right now is a portrait that's part of an ongoing year-long project that we're doing called COVID in the Classroom. Um, we've been following three high school seniors uh, in their last and very untraditional year of high school uh, here in the Boston area. Uh, this young woman, her name is Anne Lurie. She's a senior um, from Everett High, and she has been learning from home remotely and experiencing her senior year that way and actually applying and getting into college. Um, I was very interested when we began this project of really trying to um, understand and document um, her learning environment and all the other kids' learning environments. And, you know, what's I think one of the most important things I want to say about this photo is part of, of some of what you can't see, which is behind her, there are, it's a very small bedroom. There are two beds. One belongs to her sister. She shares a room with her sister. There's a young cousin who lives in the house with his mom. He kept coming in because, you know, he loves her and, you know, that's her school day is interrupted regularly in that way. And yet she's been, you know, a deeply committed student who's, who's made her way through this year. Um, and uh, the next one, if you could advance. Um, this is Thomas. He's a senior. Um, he lives in South Boston. He goes to Boston Latin School um, and he lives with his family of five in this thousand square foot home um, in South Boston. And I don't know how well you can see, but this is his classroom. He, uh, I think he's probably about 6'2 and definitely still growing. I think he's grown since I first took this photo. Um, and he, the, he uses this little uh, tray table here. Uh, that the family had just used for games and things like that. And every day he does his classes in this highly trafficked area in the main room of the house. Um, and, 
you know, I think that, and I'm sure everybody's seen that, you know, kids uh, learning environments, uh, I mean, have just really been, to use my word, upended this year. And, and I've just been amazed at, at the kids I've met, just how they are making their way through and, and also really, really struggling. Um, this other photo here, I'll just quickly say, is uh, uh, Acton Bo Boxborough High School getting ready to go back to school in September. Um, and this was sort of the feeling of how classes needed to start off this far apart in gymnasiums. Wow. Yeah. That's really, wow. Um, Jessica, let's move on and talk to talk about some of your education photos because um, this story was so amazing in all, it, it wasn't just in at home, it wasn't just at the school, it was everywhere out in the community, <laughs> as it turns out, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think as at the Globe, we tried to, we have an education team, so we tried to cover kind of as many aspects as we can. I think if you can go to the next photo, maybe, I can't remember where it is in the sequence, but, um, oh, well, this photo, I could talk about this one. This was, um, you know, right in the beginning, sort of when everything shut down, these are high school seniors at Revere. And I just happened to be kind of driving through Chelsea, and then I drove into Revere. I was just looking for people. Brian was talking about that emptiness, right? It was really hard to, that was one of the challenges was to find anybody out at all. And um, I cut through the back of this this high school parking lot and I saw these kids all camped out. And it was funny to even approach them because, you know, you didn't, you were trying not to get too close to anybody. So I was like kind of shouting from a distance, like, hey, I'm with the Boston Globe. Um, but they were high school seniors and they were trying to, figure out what the rest of their school year would look like. You know, the, the question still at that point was like, are we going to be able to have a prom? Are we going to be able to have a graduation? Um, those were all questions that sadly, you know, they weren't, we know how those panned out in the end, but um, in this moment, they still weren't sure. And then this photo is uh, of a boy with autism who, you know, had to mm -hmm. do his classes at home and had reverted to some of his sort of tendencies that he had gotten past, but he was kind of regressing. And um, and I think that this was such a big part of the story, right? With, you know, kids that sort of high needs kids couldn't be in school, couldn't get that kind of attention that they needed to get. Um, and, and we're always looking for a way to, you know, try to put a face on these issues because I think it's one thing to read about them, but it's another to be able to kind of feel somebody's situation. So that's always the goal. Um, you want to humanize uh, all of these numbers, and and you know we're we're in a time we're at the end of a year when every day we started with the numbers of who died and who was hospitalized, and to some large degree who was in school and who was not and who wasn't. So to be able to put a face on what was happening is really quite something. This is another one of these photos that's just sort of. At first I looked at it, I thought, why are we looking at a carpet? Then I realized, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, really the yeah, whole this space. Was, <laughs> this was at Boston University. They had uh, taken a, I think it was normally like a, a ballroom and they turned it into a classroom so that they could hold a, um, a big lecture and be able to safely socially distance. And when I walked in and saw this, we were sort of doing a, a quick story about what it was like to be at college. Um, I just thought, oh, I got to get up high and look down on that because it, it, you can really see the spacing and it just looks so futuristic and bizarre. <laughs> and that's kind of how this all feels, right? Did you feel, um, back to the photo when you were talking to those kids in the out of the car who had no idea what was going to happen to them, did you feel weird about um, approaching them as a stranger? Because this is all a very strange situation and we can see yeah. them separate as it was. Yeah, I felt, um, I mean, you know, I think a, a big part of our job is approaching people out in the world all the time, right? But COVID really changed that because, um, First of all, you're wearing, we were just getting used to wearing masks all the time. So, you know, you can't smile. You can't do all the things you would normally do to disarm someone. Um, and you're shouting from far away because you can't just walk up to them. So, yeah, I was really, um, I really did approach them with some trepidation. And I stayed, I mean, for me, this is like really far back, right? I'm a photographer that likes to be up close and um and really shoot like almost everything with a wide angle lens. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of be 
pushed back. And I can feel almost in this photo, my fear of, you know, um, imposing on them in this moment. It also, uh, to your point, is you know you realize as we're looking at this from you know a year later, you know how soon all of that's going to change and get worse. So as you as you mentioned before, yeah. um, Brian, talk to me about your photos. Um, we're still in the education theme. Um, talk to me about the. Uh, yeah. So, go ahead. No, about it, this is about the Boston School teacher, Princess Bryant. Yeah, so this is Princess. She teaches kindergarten in Boston Public Schools and lives in a, I think it's generous to call it a studio apartment. It's small. Um, and, uh, you know, she was trying to engage kindergartners remotely from this tiny space in her apartment. Um, you know, it was tough and she really, it was really hard of her for her to not be able to connect to the kids. Um, the way she normally would. I mean, teaching kindergarten is very, you know, they have short attention spans and it takes a certain skill to uh, to keep them engaged. And, you know, I mean, it's not like learning math tables or teaching algebra remotely. I mean, it's a whole different way of teaching kids that young. And it was really hard for her. And then in the next picture in the fall, she was, that was in the spring. So this is in the fall. She was back in her classroom, but going to teach remotely from there which was better for her, Princess, as a teacher. I'm not sure it was better, you know, the outcome was any better. I mean, at least the kids could see a room, the room they would have been in and have some connection to it if they ever got back into it. But, you know, it was good for her to get out of the, get out and teach from a classroom at least. Well, she had some space, at least. Yeah. Angela, what about props. your uh, I'm sorry, Brian, yeah. And more props. More things to yeah. show them. <laughs> yes. Well, also some things that can resonate with them, like this is really school. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> um, Angela, talk about balancing uh, the story about balancing uh, classes at home um, with the risk of going into homes yourself, something similar to what Jessica was saying earlier. So normally photojournalists, we try not to cover our families at all or friends or anything related to us. We'd like to keep it very separate. And in this case, um, my niece and nephews were starting school and I was nervous about going into schools. By this point, I had been laid off. And so without an employer to take care of me, if I were to get sick, I was very concerned. And I had I had looked into reaching out to some families, but in the end, um, I ended up going to photograph my niece and nephew while they were um, doing school remotely. Um, my niece just started the first grade and here she is concentrating hard on her computer and there was some kind of a little glitch and she reacted. Um, and I think, some of the little kids, they're very good at adapting to um, Zoom and other things because that's, I guess, all they've been experiencing at this point. But it's really hard socially. Um, this is my nephew at home. He's, um, he's nine and, you know, normally he'd be in a classroom full of kids. He's used to that. Um, and not having that social interaction, I think, is really hard for kids, um, you know, they would take sort of breaks in between, but it's it's something that like really stripped kids of their their ability to interact with each other and even with their teachers. I think they, you know, you don't always think about like, oh, I miss my teacher, but I think in this case, a lot of kids have missed that experience. Well, you have an interesting contrast because the little furrowed brow on your niece, so close, so tight on her face, so you can really get that frustration of what's happening. And then with your nephew, um, it's a little bit more space, but it's the same kind of, you know, isolating, limited situation. You've just managed to show it in two different ways. And I'll say that they're, I mean, they're very lucky to have a home where they can be in separate rooms while they're doing school. Um, I've seen there's a lot of families that don't have that. They are cramming two or three kids in a room, um, trying to do their work together while you know, the parents are also trying to work from home or may have had to, you know, quit their jobs to take care of their kids. So I think there's a whole spectrum, but 
you know, even in this situation, it's it's still difficult. All right, let's move to our next grouping. It's we're calling it daily life, and um, I was taken with something that um, you said earlier, Brian, about um, because all of us were locked up. Uh, most of the time, we were learning about daily life, even on our own blocks, from what you all were doing, because you were the people out and about and being in various daily lives. Uh, uh, well, we the only life we were having pretty much was inside. <laughs> um, so that made a difference. But Angela, we're starting with your photo. Um, and wow, um, it's really, that's something. That yeah, so is. these two, these two little girls are used to playing together every day. They're best friends. They live across the street from each other, and normally they'd be next to each other. And in an effort to still connect, they lined up all their dolls across the street. They were they were making up little stories and and playing together um, while their parents kind of watched from a distance. So it was interesting to see how people were adapting to this um, because I think- When this happened, driving by, did somebody tell you about it? How did you find this moment? Um, a reporter actually found this family uh, because we were, we were searching for a family, you know, or people who were doing, just trying to cope with the situation and, right. So the reporter found found this family. And one thing that happened is I went down there, the reporter did not, and it was all the way down in Franklin. And so it's quite a drive, although it was a lot faster without the traffic. Um, so yeah, so I mean, it was one of those things where we're going out there and we're interacting with people. And normally you would go up to the parents and talk to them for a little bit, but they were 20 feet away. You know, and even with the little kids, it was, it felt so far away, so distant, um, when normally you would, you'd be up closer to establish rapport with people. So it, it just, that part of our job became harder, that you couldn't connect with people you're photographing in the same way. I just think it's, I'm taken with the fact that they fell into this as their daily lives too, is what we have to do. So we'll just play across the road from each other. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another photo of and is this to show us just how very few people were on public transportation because that's what it reads to me that's how it reads so, to me i was actually sent to find um to show how crowded the t was because somebody had complained i think there was one train early in the morning that was very crowded but by the time i got there there was almost nobody and i was waiting around like where are people and Finally, these two people showed up and they're sitting on opposite ends of the bench, they're masked. And that was kind of just what I saw there. It was even to try to show any sort of crowd, there were just a couple of people coming off the train. And that was, that was, I believe, in March. So it was still early on and people were starting to stay home there. But also, with they're both masked and staying apart from each other. So we're, we're having the message that this is nothing to play with. Um, mm -hmm. All right, Brian, father um, is waiting to hear uh, drive up confessions. This is in Chelmsford. Tell us about it. Yeah, yeah they, apparently people still had sins to confess even though they were locked in their houses. Um, this church was, they just put out the word they were gonna do it and the cars were like, you know, out onto the street waiting to line up to, there were two priests in the parking lot and you drove up and rolled down your window and did your confession and drove home. So he's just waiting for the, Brian, Father Brian's just waiting for the next uh, next car to pull up. How many cars would you say were waiting to? Oh, waiting to 30 cars probably waiting. Some, people, some cars had more like three people in the car that all needed to do confession. So, I mean, it was, I, I, you know, when I went there, I was like, you know, I had no idea. There could have been like no cars, um, but there was, there were a lot of people. Well, that in itself is an adjustment because someone else is hearing your confession. You can't even have your privacy. In yeah, that well, they worked hard to keep it like, I mean, those cars are pretty far apart. And no, I'm the people in the car. If you have three people in the car. Oh, yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> if you have a secret from your family, it's secret no more. <laughs> okay. Meredith, tell us about your photo. <laughs> I'm waiting to see it. Oh, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so this, uh, as businesses slowly began to open up, um, I was looking around a lot to see what that looked like, especially, uh, I think, with the first phase of reopening, the the guidelines were very strict, but also it was the first time businesses ever had to deal with such guidelines. So I think, you know, they'd be quite different now. Um, this is a hair salon um, in Roxbury, and I had gone in there and, uh, you know, they did their best to have chairs six feet apart. and. Um, but part of why I, I wanted to take this photo was there are so many things in people's lives that just require contact and proximity, you know, not, not just the hug and the, the hand holding and the, uh, the support, but, you know, getting your hair done or doing certain things in a grocery store. And um, so I sort of feel like this is, this is a business sort of struggling to, to stay open and, and be a part of the community and provide service and, and as safely as possible. Mm -hmm. um, the next one. Yeah, this is um. So this uh, was the very first game of the Dor uh, Dorchester Little League um, taken this summer, um, and you know I think Jess mentioned earlier this, uh, you know, caution tape um, just sort of becoming a part of our lives and in places where we just normally, you know, would never see tape like that prior to the pandemic. If you had seen tape like that, you'd think something terrible had happened there. There had been some sort of crime scene, and yet there was this tape and these boys thrilled to see each other and having a joyful time. What you can't see off to the left side though, is parents who are, who are even further back against more tape. Um, so, you know, that that's also another uh, interesting aspect of uh, this image that's not quite visible. Yeah, okay. Jessica, um, you've got this photo about uh, Thanksgiving travel that's pretty interesting. Oh, this is a, another picture of daily life before we get to, well, you this is yours too, Jessica, but I was particularly interested in that one and the next one. This is pretty poignant. Um, yeah, this so was, well, mm -hmm. this was at a, oh, sorry. This was at a moment where, um, you know, cathedrals had kind of reopened, but they were sort of looping off, trying to socially distance the pews. And, um, and yeah, so this was another one where you're kind of like hesitant to, to approach someone, right? And, and it's a, for me, religion is always a really tough thing to photograph because you want to um, you want to be really respectful. Yeah. yeah. So um, so luckily, I actually ran into this guy outside, and um, and I was like, "Hey, where's the part of the chapel that's open?" And he's like, "Oh, I'm going there." And I was like, "Oh, great! I'm with the globe. Can I photograph you while you're in there?" Um, but you know, you're still tiptoeing, and and it was just a way to kind of show, you know, he was obviously very devout coming out at this point. Um, yeah, anyway, and then to go to the next one, the Thanksgiving travel was just one of those, you know, um, go to Logan Airport to to see what's happening, right? Because nobody was really supposed to be traveling for Thanksgiving, and um, and of course people were. <laughs> and, and so I had gone there and I was trying to figure out ways to photograph it, and as I was going back to my car, I, these guys started running down the terminal, so I just lifted my camera and banged off a couple of frames. But, you know, to me, this is like a one of those moments that kind of shows how much COVID just permeated into every aspect of our lives, right? Like even a just a kind of happy, go lucky photo like this is there's so much, it's tinged with so much fear and uncertainty. And We're so gonna start through some of these photographs because we have many more to get to and uh, before we conclude this program. So Jessica, just, um, the next one is the two people, uh, next one of Jessica's, let's see it. There we go. That's uh, two people separated by, um, well, I assume this is Thanksgiving as well, right? But let's, I, I don't wanna spend, uh, I'm gonna try to move along here. So um, tell me briefly what's happening. Yeah, this is just um, inside, a, inside a nursing home in Medford. Um, this woman was able to see her mother for the first time again. Um, they started allowing visits, but she had to be behind plexiglass. And, um, you know, they had these microphones in case you couldn't, like, hear each other. So right. it was kind of like karaoke. <laughs> but not. But um, not. Brian, <laughs> Brian, your next photo, the next photo of yours is uh, quite striking um, because this really is daily life. It's a lot of stuff going on in this photo. 
this was back in Seattle. This was a couple that were trying to like, they were so afraid of being in the city because it seemed like there was more COVID there and it was scarier and more dangerous. So they had, they have this school bus that's converted to a camper and they were out camping. But even that early on, she was doing a, a Kung Fu class virtually through the, uh, through her iPhone while, while her husband was cooking breakfast. Hmm. We're going to move past your next one. Um, people will, will recognize um, cutouts in the sports arena. As you say, there's one person in there really taking a photo. That's pretty interesting. But I want to move to our next uh, category, which is protest. Um, as everyone knows, there were several pandemics going on. One was the coronavirus one. The other one was racial reckoning. Um, and these photos, um, Jessica, you were out and about um, taking photos. This happened, I think, as people will remember, pretty much after George Floyd, um, which was in May. Uh, so I don't know quite the date of this photo, of your photos um, in this section, but let's take a look and maybe each of you can give me um, a, a quick uh, summary of what you were saying. So Jessica, I'll start with you. I mean, what you were seeing when you were out on the streets. Yeah, I mean, I think what was striking uh, just in terms of the pandemic uh, about the protests where it was the first time that we had really been in large groups of people, right? So there was something about that. I remember when the first time I had showed up to cover a protest and I saw hundreds of people walk walking across the Boston Common and I thought, oh my God, I have to get in that crowd, right? I had just spent months trying to keep my distance from people, yeah. trying to avoid people, but there's no other way to do this job. You just have to do it. You have to just get in there. So um, there was, you know, but but I think it also spoke to how passionately people felt, you know, I mean, just how moved people were, that they were willing to risk their health to go out and protest, um, you know, because this was a really obviously a big deal. So yeah, I'll, I'll pass it along to the other people because I think they have more photos in this category than I do. Yes, uh, Brian, uh, give me a, a quick uh, summary of what's happening in your protest photos. The reason I that we put these two pictures in is I really feel like they, at least for me, it was really hard to separate COVID pandemic from protest and racial justice protests from, like they were always intertwined. So in both of these, they could be read either way. Um, there was right. no getting away from one or the other while you were there. And so we sort of chose these because they they show the way it sort of came together. Angela? Um, this was from Indigenous Peoples Day um, March in Boston. And like the others said, I think the fact that people were coming out in a pandemic shows how important the issue of racial justice is. Um, and people were people were coming together, and I will say that at these marches, fortunately, the majority of people were masked and doing their best to maintain social distancing. Um, when covering some of the open up the economy marches and some Trump rallies, a lot of people were not masked, and it was very frightening to have people literally feeling them breathe on you, which may be gross in another situation. Um, to know that it could be literally fatal or um, contagious, you, at the very least, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so it was experience. Mm -hmm. Meredith. Yeah, just really quickly, this is a, a photo um, from a protest in the fall um, in Nubian Square, uh, sort of in memory of Breonna Taylor. And and part of why I included it is sort of this this merging of protest and memorial. Uh, to me, that has been such a profound thing over the last year. Um, and uh, so you can see here that uh, there are a few young women, but the one in the front is, is holding a flower up. And um, soon after this, they marched down to City Hall where things were quite different after that. But, but this moment was really poignant. So the next category is politics. You know, sometimes it's really hard to remember that even though as intense as that campaign was mm -hmm. with so much going on with coronavirus that politics was also a big part of what was happening and you all were everywhere doing that. I wanna just push through these photos and just stop on maybe uh, two, Brian and Angela because they're uh, opposite of uh, each other in, in uh, content. Uh, 
in some way. So Brian, uh, talk about uh, your second photograph. This is your first, which is at the vice presidential um, debate, but let's go to the second one. Yes, there we go. Yeah, like like with the protests, there was no separating, in some ways there was, you know, the politics and the campaigning was intertwined with the pandemic and it became incredibly politicized. And so this this pair of pictures sort of brings home that point. This is clearly a person that doesn't think much about mask wearing. Um, for, and then you go to Angela's picture next. There we and go. She, she can take over. Oh, this was a just a pop-up um, mask distribution at um, Revere Beach, and people were all taking the masks. And this family, um, they were fixing the masks so that it would fit their little boy, and they were obviously more more concerned. They were taking the advice of the the CDC and the and Revere um, officials. So, and they had already been wearing masks, but. A lot of people didn't at that point didn't have access to a lot of new masks. So some people were just wearing the same one that they had. So people were very appreciative when they would get free masks. Meredith, we're gonna run through your photos here. Um, a lot of political ones. Let's take a look. Uh, this is local politics. Obviously, um, Senator Markey, uh, I believe we were in Dorchester here. Um, and he, this is the last stretch uh, of his campaign. Okay. I think here, like, you know, proximity, like the need for prayer to be close, and yet we're yeah. supposed to be distant. Um, this was the evening that um, Biden and Harris were officially declared winners of the election. And um, if anybody was around Boston, this was um, near the common, a very big celebration broke out. All right. And these are some other uh, photos by Brian and Meredith. And I'm just gonna, people will recognize the, this is a Trump rally from, from you, Brian, but I'm gonna move on. If you'll forgive me, I'm gonna move on to our last category, which is where we are now. I wanna make sure we get there. Um, and Meredith, your photo is up first. Yeah, and there's one after this. Well, so I thought of starting this with the photo that's next, which is about the vaccine. But actually, I really want to start it with this because this was the first person I ever met who and heard the term long hauler, COVID long hauler. This is a, a former supervisor in a nursing home who became very sick with COVID in April, so sick in the hospital within a week, a week coma, induced coma for three weeks, rehab for a month later. And when I met him a few months later, he struggled to come down the stairs of his house to be photographed and had to sit in the chair. And, and you can see the mask is falling off his face. And I remember the struggle for him just to keep lifting it. Um, and, you know, I, I feel it's important to start there because when we sort of think where we are now, we're, we're still wrestling with this thing. People are at very personal levels, um, but also, you know, as, a, as an area, as a country. Um, so I think starting with him is is really uh, really important. Um, your next photo, the person's getting sure. a vaccine. Yeah, very um, quickly. This was a few weeks ago. Um, this is the very first uh, staff person at Tufts Medical Center to get a vaccine. Uh, doctor, and I apologize for not remembering her name. Um, you can see the difference between the portrait, which is a very intimate uh, thing, and this was a press event. Um, but you know, she, uh, she received the vaccine and as well as many other staff members there at Tufts and, and people at other hospitals in the area did as well that week. Jessica, uh, your two photos are, um, um, are where we are now with the nurse at the life care center at Neshoba Valley. Um, can you briefly just tell me what those photo, what that photo is about? And then we can, because it, yeah. I think it brings conclusion to where we where we are yeah um you, you know i think that there this story in many ways started out in nursing homes right and um and so to be in a nursing home in december uh while they were vaccinating people in residents inside felt you know it, it felt sort of fitting and it also felt kind of incredible to be able to have seen that within a year um you know a virus come the scientific community figure out a way to, to get a vaccine and to get it out to people. We would never have envisioned ourselves being inside a nursing home 
you know, m months prior to this, right? Um, so this was kind of, in many ways, it's been a, a really nice light at the end of the tunnel, like a, a beautiful thing for us to be able to see, right? Because we have seen so much horrible stuff um, when it comes to COVID. But I think if you look at the next photo, um, we're also still in it. I mean, so this was a couple weeks after I shot that, the the nursing home vaccines. I'm, I'm in Worcester in the DCU center that they've turned into a COVID field hospital. And, um, you know, you can see that the, the healthcare worker is wearing like an air purification mask um, because everybody inside here is COVID positive. Every patient is COVID positive. So it's a, it's a hot zone. Um, and I was inside, you know, again, kind of taking this crazy risk, but because it just feels like we have to remind people that yes, the vaccine is here, but, um, but the risk of COVID is still present and, you know, please don't let your guard down, right? We're all going to get there eventually, but um, we're not there yet. So we want to conclude with the question that we've been asking everybody all day in our A Year Apart um, coverage. And that for each of you, if you could each maybe give me a very brief um, how COVID has changed you in this year apart. And then we're going to go to audience questions. I'll start with you, Brian. Um, well, the obvious thing is I got sick and still am sick. Um, but aside from that, yeah, you know, everyone's risk tolerance is unique, is personal. Um, but for me, as a photojournalist, if I wasn't willing to go out and cover this story, why would I be a photojournalist? So I guess it sort of reaffirmed mm. why I do what I do. Um, you know, it's sort of for stories like this. All Which, right. um, I think that, you know, I also brought that risk home. Jessica? Um, <laughs> I think that I've aged like a decade in this past year, if I'm being honest. You know, it's just been this constant undercurrent of stress and worry. Um, but, you know, I think the, the flip side to that is that I'm more grateful than ever to all the people who have allowed us into their lives to document them, especially in a year like this when just allowing us to be there at all is a risk, you know? So, um, so yeah, I guess that's. I that's how you got changed. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Angela. <laughs> um, well, for starters, I lost my staff photography job due to COVID, um, which starting a freelance career in the middle of a pandemic is, is difficult, but it has brought, it's given me time to work on my writing, work on personal projects, and do research for long-term projects that have been kind of desiring to do for a long time. So in some ways, that's the silver lining. But um, yeah, so it's been an interesting time. Meredith. Yeah, I think my answer is similar to Jess's answer. I, I think it's really heightened for me the feeling that um, you know, getting back to your quote from Eisenstadt, like what, what, you know, no fear. Well, I, I do have fear. And part of the fear I have is that, to, that I always do right by the people who open their lives up to me and, and to our reporters and telling their story. And this has been a deeply challenging year in that way, um, because just people have, are going through so much. And, and so I just, I just feel a constant acute sense of that, I think. So not necessarily a change, but just going from a strong sense to you know just heightened all the time awareness around that and and the you know the power that i am carrying around when i show up with my camera and making sure i do right by people well a more hopeful quote photographs open doors into the past but they also allow a look into the future that's sally mann so we're transitioning to your questions and i have a few um some of them are similar so um uh, a couple of people asked was there one photo that just encapsulated, you know, what the pandemic work that you did uh, said in one photo. Um, somebody put it as a pandemic on a plate, if you had to pick one. Anybody? Is it okay to say I I can't? I like I mean I think this pandemic and you know we've we've only even now in this hour hit a fraction of what. I think we'd want to talk about. So I, I hate to have this answer. I always do this. I'm told, you know, I never just give the straight answer, but 
uh, there's no pandemic on a plate for me. Okay. At all. Yeah, yeah, I think well, like I, yeah, I think like I said, it touched everything. It touched okay. how cities looked. It touched how it touched politics, protest, food, how what you ate. It touched everything. So I don't know how you would put that in one picture. All right, um, Jackie wants to know what photo or scene did you shoot that made you realize the sheer enormity of the pandemic? For me, that was the funeral home photo. I mean, 100%. Uh, yeah, I think that, that it was so jarring. Beyond the fact that we never are in places like that, we never get that kind of access, right? To see it um, just so completely overwhelmed. Um, yeah, that really hit home for me and made it really very real. And I think there was, there, was a day I was out, there was a day I was outside a nursing home in Chelsea where in the space of an hour and a half, three different hearses came up to pick up people that had died. So that day was certainly one that made the point. So follow up to that, Donna asks, uh, how do you steel yourself to the grief, the need, the pain? I don't know if you really do, right? I mean, I think that in the moment you, um, you, have to, you have to empathize, right? Otherwise, I don't think it's worth being there. <laughs> um, so, but you're trying to remain professional. And I think that doing this work is always, it's always difficult for that reason because yes, these in the end they're photographs, but for you they're a series and compilation of moments in, that aren't exactly yours, but you were present for, right? So um, it's a hard thing to entirely divorce yourself from, but you have to remind yourself that you're just there to kind of bear witness and, and to try to not bring it all back home. Um, and I think the enormity of the enormity of this situation, I think we just feel like there has to be documentation of what's going on for, you know, for the years to come. Um, you know, there's a few photos from the um, the flu pandemic 100 years ago. And I think that we take these risks so that the public can be aware of what's going on. And I mean, without this information being disseminated, a lot of people would they really wouldn't know what's going on at all. Right. Stanley and another person whose name I can't find right now ask, have you ever thought this is too personal and it shouldn't be shared? I mean, sometimes, yeah, I think that sometimes yeah. you pass on moments because it doesn't feel like it's yours, right? Um, I don't know how to explain that. I, I just think that sometimes, like I always want, for me, I need permission. If I'm gonna do something really intimate, I, I need to ask the people involved if they're okay with it. And if they are, then then that's the opening. But if they're not, for me, it feels a little bit like stealing. I might be alone in that, but that's just me. Yeah. Anybody else? Agree. All right. Nancy asks, has the pandemic changed how you make photographs? I mean, we're working with masks on that, that fog up our cameras. So <laughs> just the physical sense of all the protection we need to wear just to work. Um, we're further away from our subjects. We're used to occasionally touching somebody on the shoulder to maybe direct them if it's a portrait. Um, and just being able to smile at people. I mean, there is a whole conversation going on about consent in photos and we don't necessarily say, hey, can I take your picture? But we usually make eye contact with somebody. There's some sort of interaction with the people we photograph that is important. And it's a little bit harder when we're all covered up. I'm gonna um, add something to that because I read that question totally differently. I thought she meant from an artistic point, did it change your art, your craft? and how you do photographs, not necessarily about the practical ways in which you had to do it. I, I for me, actually, 
Yes, I think it can, it can go both ways. I, you know, I, I getting back to what Jess said about photographing with a, with a wide angle lens, I think when things are better, I'm gonna be far less likely to use a, a long zoom lens. I just, I, I feel like th this whole experience of struggling to get close now um, has just shifted for me uh, the feeling of being far away and zooming in. I just, it's made me want to get closer I think it'd be even more intimate uh, in the moment in that way. It, it's, it's led me to feel like that somehow that will just feel even more authentic, but we'll, we'll see. But that's sort of a feeling I'm left with. Anybody else? Are y'all on the same page? Yeah. Okay. Steven asked, do you consider your photographs as documentary photography or, for, or photojournalism? I don't think of those two things as being different necessarily um so is that a to me photojournalism is a document of history and of the moment and hopefully documentary photography is the same thing right i think the difference for me at least has been you know in in past years i've been able to spend a lot of time with my subjects like months and um that's that feels almost unethical in a moment of a pandemic so um, so maybe it's less of a, a hardcore documentary in that regard, but it's still definitely a documentation. Well, and the, the thought process is the same, whether you're there for four months or four minutes. I mean, you're, you're still, the approach is the same. The goal is the same. Nancy asks, this is a good follow-up to that. How will this time change how you approach assignments post-pandemic? whenever we get there. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I mean, maybe with more time, I thought, sorry, I'd, I'd have a different answer, but I don't, I don't know that it will. I mean, I, I think you always go in with, you know, just uh, having a lot of care for, for the, what we're asking for by being present with people and, paying attention, trying to just really pay attention to what, what it is in, in front of me. And, um, and like I said earlier, just do right by it, but maybe my colleagues have something else. No, I think what we're saying is that, you know, what makes good photojournalists and photojournalism and is the same, like this didn't change any of that. So what we're going to do when we take pictures in the future, you know, maybe we'll be better photographers for the experience, but the how and why and we do it shouldn't shouldn't change. All right. Um, is there any one thing I would ask each of you that you would want people to take away from having experienced a year through your eyes and your photographs tonight? <laughs> Who's going first? Quick. <laughs> I guess it's good to be grateful for what you have. I think this whole experience has given us a perspective that of how grateful we should be about some of the little things. When I'm photographing people with food insecurity, I'm grateful that I have a full fridge. I'm grateful um, for a lot of those things. And I'm, I'm honestly, I'm very grateful for the experience of having people let us into their lives and, you know, allow us to photograph them and get to know them and share their stories with the public. I think it's really, it's really powerful. Anybody like to add anything? I, I don't want to I don't want to make it political, but as someone who got sick being around people that didn't take precautions seriously, I mean, I would hope that people look at these pictures and think maybe I should take the precautions seriously. And I, I would just I would just say when, you know, hopefully enough people are vaccinated, there's herd immunity and you know, we we reach a time where we're not um, dealing with this in the same way, though. That th this uh, there is still uh, so much that this has brought forward that has just been there to begin with. That um, that I hope that we uh, begin to address in a way that we seem to have rallied around at least the pandemic and vaccines in the same way. You know, a lot of these other issues that um, I think have emerged in a very profound way, even though they've been there for a long time. Mm. Okay. 
Well, Brian, Meredith, Angela, Jessica, thank you for bearing witness for all of us. Um, and thank all of you for joining us. That's been a year apart, a pandemic in photographs. Thank you all. Good evening. <laughs>